Derek and Ashley live. Ashley's having her chicken wings. Sorry. All, all foods fit, remember. And me, it's 5.30. To me, it's cocktail hour. I would like to be holding a cocktail in my hand, but that'll be later. So I was just talking to Ashley saying that one of the many sessions that I had today with, with a client was really about how your partner can be supportive or not supportive during your recovery. And I'm saying eating disorder recovery or intuitive eating um, because it, it takes a village when someone is struggling with binging or restricting and the eating disorder voice becomes very strong. It's actually very helpful if you can express that. If you have a partner who's willing to help you, whether the part it's your partner or a parent, who's willing to really listen and offer ways of helping that are productive. And that's really what we just I spent the last hour doing is is helping someone's partner understand when she's asking for help, whether it's her eating disorder voice or her healthy voice. It was um it was very helpful to really sit down and just strategize and having it come from her. So I'm wondering, Ashley, have you ever had that experience or heard about other people who were getting support <laughs> from their partners or parents or whomever? Yeah. Um, so I think that most of the time people tend to talk about how unhelpful uh, partners and family members and friends can be. I know I definitely experienced that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I was struggling with binging throughout college, I had some friends who were shaming me for it. And that was really rough. Ooh, um, that's terrible. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I first started intuitive eating, you know, my mother was very much like, what are you doing? Like, this doesn't make any sense. How mm -hmm. does this help you lose weight? Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, I think that that's definitely something to talk about because, you know, these are the important people in our lives and we have to figure out how to be resilient against that kind of discussion. But I also think that um, there is a way to create um, safety around yourself mm -hmm. and to sort of, um, you know, like we can't choose our family, right? That's correct. But we can choose our friends. We can choose who we surround ourselves with. And we also, I think, have, you know, when we try to set boundaries with our family, there's a lot of stuff that's in that, you know, it's it's difficult, especially if it's your parents. Absolutely. Um, but when we set boundaries, boundaries with friends um, and, and with significant others, I think there's a lot more respect there. Um, and so I think that that's a huge tool to use to make sure that the relationship you have with your friends, significant others, the people you choose in your life, um, make sure that they're healthy and not toxic um, to, and, and don't feed into your disorder. I also think like personally, I found my boyfriend isn't necessarily like an intuitive eater, but he's heard me talk about this stuff so much that when, <clears throat> I remember we had gone out to eat lunch and we had had a very difficult discussion and it kind of manifested in me eating without thinking and um, then feeling really guilty about it, uh, which, you know, having guilt related to my food consumption isn't something I usually have. But when I'm in an emotionally vulnerable place, it can come up because it's a way to, you know, mask the real emotional issue going on and focus on the food. Absolutely. I'm glad that you mentioned that. One second. Yeah, I'll just say that, that that was the case, you know, earlier with the couple that I was working with where um there was a an emotionally charged issue that was causing the person to to actually to binge eat. And so it's good to be able to recognize that there's an underlying issue that's not being addressed. Yeah, and I mean that's usually the case, but that's still worth mentioning. Yeah, well, right, but I'm just saying like that's that's usually what's happening, but in in this situation, um my boyfriend, I was, I was able to articulate what was going on, um, which is another key thing, being able to articulate what you're thinking and, and, and what's happening in your head to another person that you're trying to have support you. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I said to him, like, I'm, I'm feeling really guilty right now, I shouldn't have eaten that. Um, 
and he recognized the speech pattern, right? Like as soon as you say, I shouldn't have done X, Y, Z. Um, and he came over to my side of the booth and he was like, no guilt, remember? It was really, it was a really sweet moment. Um, oh, I love this guy. <laughs> because it's not, it's not something we've had an explicit conversation about, you know? I mean, I've, I've been as open as I can with, with what I've gone through, but it's one of those things that, like, unless you ask a specific question, it's kind of hard to run the gamut of information when it comes to this stuff. So, you know, it's sort of um, articulated to me that though I hadn't explicitly explained it to him, that the things that I had said had informed this idea that, like, food is not about guilt. And that he was then able to help me remember that in a moment that was emotionally difficult for me. So he was a wonderful source of support, which, you know, I just want to make the point that we've talked a lot about what's happening with the holidays, but, you know, really Thanksgiving is over and we really are now experiencing, I am anyway, lots of parties where food is plentiful. There are a lot of fear foods out there. There's there's plenty of ways to find yourself eating emotionally or not eating. And so if you do have a friend, a partner, or someone who you really do trust, it can be very helpful for that person to be your um, your 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 helping your helper, your friend, your supporting person, and to be able to speak honestly and openly because you know eating disorders um, thrive in secrecy and being able to share that. We've talked about that before. And when I say eating disorders, it could be emotional eating, it could be any kind of any kind of um, imbalanced eating. I'll just leave it at that. So. Well, I mean, yes and no, because I think definitely eating disorders, eating disorders thrive in secrecy, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that sometimes disordered eating thrives in using it as a bonding tool, right? You know what? That That's a good, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. yeah. You always, you always make me think twice. <laughs> but I said, thank you. I like that. But yeah, because I, I feel like sometimes, especially women, we use dieting and restrictive behaviors as a way to be like, I'm following the female or femme script. That's what I'm doing. And I'm explaining to you and justifying it to you and making sure that you know that I'm not defying the status quo with my behavior. Um, and there's a way that we sort of socially like check each other uh, with that kind of discussion. And that's another thing that that is going on right now, a lot of it because of mm -hmm. you know the holidays and such. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, so I think if you're struggling with a severe eating disorder or something that would be categorized not so much as disordered eating um, or restrained eating, but an eating disorder, that it's more about um, casting aside the shame related to your behaviors. Absolutely. And um, uh, trying to be as open as possible with people who are safe, right? Yeah. And okay. reaching out to people who will support you. And then if it's a disordered eating uh, situation, I would say that it's uh, important to recognize when that diet talk is happening and to actively, either in your head or to the people discussing, um, uh, not refute it, but um, I mean, I guess refute it is an acceptable phrase. You know what I'm going to say? You can refute it or you can say, this is not something I would like to discuss. I don't talk about my diet and walk away. Yeah, I like arm yourself against it. Yes, it would absolutely. Be, you know where I'd want to say it. Um, and I, I mean, I think anyone in eating disorder recovery can do that as well. I just think that with, I mean, even there is an element of secrecy with disordered eating too, because a lot of times when you're um, heavily restricting, right, you'll verbalize that you're heavily restricting in order to adhere to that like societal ideal I was talking about. Mm -hmm. But then in private, you'll be sh probably struggling with binging because Absolutely. that's what happens. So, and there's that um, shame. Yeah. And there's the shame associated with that. So I think, it, yes, eating disorders work to isolate you. They work to cut you off from all of your relationships. 
and they convince you or they try to convince you that no one wants to hear about your struggles. No one, you know, like no one's going to understand all of these things. Um, and none of that is true. Um, and that's sort of, I think, the things that we need to fight against in terms of like the eating disorder uh, voice that we talk about. You know, I want to make a comment about that because when I find when someone who's really been very private about their eating disorder opens up to a trusted friend or a parent, they often are very surprised at the response they receive, which is, oh, I, you know, that was me, or I know so many people who've had an eating disorder, and it's really, you know, let, how can I help you? And people have been, have told me they're very surprised. They didn't know that it was so prevalent. So I think that's an interesting point to make, that everyone knows someone who struggled with an eating disorder. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that sometimes people have known someone who struggled with an eating disorder, but don't realize it, you mm -hmm. know, because like, there's so many people out there engaging in eating disordered behaviors that we just consider like oh, normal. Exciting. Yeah. Um, but I will definitely attest to that. Like when I um, started opening up about it, I mean, it, you know, now that I'm like in the anti-diet recovery community, it's like everyone has had an eating disorder, you know, like everyone I talk to has struggled with this stuff. And, but when I was alone, you know, when I, when it, when I wasn't in this community, I felt like I was the only one. Absolutely. That's the isolating factor that you talked about. Yeah. Yeah. You're not alone. Anyone who's watching this, if you're struggling, you are not alone. And there are plenty of people who want to help you. And I think that, you know, something my mom used to say to me was, um, everyone has disordered eating. Everyone has a weird relationship with food. And the way she used to say it, it wasn't this encouraging, sorry, one second, uh, alarm went off. It wasn't this encouraging, like, you're not alone, people out there understand. It was more of like, you're not special, everyone deals with this, it's fine. And so I just wanted to sort of make that distinction too, because just because something is normal, doesn't mean it's okay, right? Like, just because something is the status quo doesn't mean it's okay. How many things in the course of history were considered legal and societally acceptable that we now look at and are like, what the fuck was everyone thinking, right? So, absolutely, absolutely. and yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, maybe in 50 years, maybe in 100 years, people will say, why did they put people on diets? What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Right. I mean, oh. it's the same thing with, with, the, with um, you know, medical science. Mm -hmm. You know, how many, I mean, if you think to back to like, what was it? Like 1600s, 1800s, they used to like put leeches on you. I was just thinking you. about that image. <laughs> the image of the leeches. <laughs> yeah. That's how we fix everyone. We yeah. leech them. Just yeah. it's called bleeding. <laughs> no. <laughs> like no <laughs> but you know? we do that was that was uh the state of the art <laughs> treatment that, of the time. that was the state of the art treatment of the time That's and it. you know it's it's funny because you know we're moving into talking about like science and like health at every size is sort of where the conversation is going and you know it's one of those things where people will say all the time like science is, that's the facts it's the research you can't refute the research blah 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 right and there's this idea that science is an unbiased form of information. I have to just say that recently there have been several researchers whose information and studies have been rescinded because they, oh my goodness, because they didn't interpret the data correctly or they fudged the data to make it look the way they wanted. Well, right, because there's money involved too. There's a lot of money involved, big pharma, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's um, money involved. There's personal bias involved. Like there's, there are studies that have shown that like in a research study, you can unintentionally bias the research just because of your own internalized beliefs. I mean, that's why we have things like double blind studies. Absolutely. But even in a double blind study, you still can influence the research with your behavior. That's 100% factual. 
Right. And then the things that get studied, the things that get funding, that's completely pushed by political agendas, by mm-hmm. cultural ideas. Um, the Like you said, the way we interpret the data mm-hmm. um, and and, you know, what gets paid attention to. Like there's so much research out there supporting health at every size. And there is zero research out there supporting the uh, effectiveness of intentional weight loss for long-term health. So why do we- Absolutely, and I I wanna make a point that I don't know where I read this today. I don't know if you posted it, someone else posted it. I don't know if it came through my feed about how there's a new gut bacteria that they're studying to, because it's not leptin, that's the hunger or ghrelin, that there are some other factors and they're looking to study obesity and eating disorders. And I want to say, again, this equating obesity as a disease, mm. is the same phrase as eating disorders and anorexia. Uh, and, and it was actually very disturbing. Mm. So I want to make that point again. Um, I have to find that. I have to find that and post it. Yeah, but, you know, I just... It's so like as an English major, you know, my my whole um, education was around like critical thinking and um, sort of uh, analysis, critical analysis. Right. And science always frustrated me because there's this idea that there's a single right answer. And it seemed very clear to me that that just wasn't the case. But everyone around me was like, no, 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 this is clearly the right answer. Right. Yes. Even though the study may say further research is needed. <laughs> that's research usually needed. Is needed, right? Like, further research is needed. And that's the thing about science, too. Like at the core of science is the scientific method. And the scientific method states that you continue to test your hypothesis over and over and over. over. And over. Over oh, again. Correct. Right? It never ends. Like that's that's what science is. It's about questioning the findings. It's not about saying, look, this is the answer. Absolutely. Like, what wh- where has science gone? Like this is I'm just gonna say we've been talking about even talking about nutritional facts. When I learned about nutrition a million years ago, I remember it. Everything fat was evil. Dietary fat was evil. We had to have a very low fat diet. We knew that we needed to eat carbohydrates and a moderate amount of protein, but fats were really bad for you. And then what happened? We found out that actually fats are very important for health, extremely important for health. They have so many important um, components, omega-3 fatty acids, essential fats that we need to um, for our brains to work, for our fat soluble vitamins to be absorbed and we actually find that people are have are more heart healthy when they consume a moderate amount of dietary fat versus low fat and so again the things that we used to think have been turned around right. where people right now are thinking about low carb low carb carbohydrate is an essential component <laughs> essential nutrient you need it to to fuel your body to yeah. function yeah and the other thing to go on and on about that. Sorry. No, no, the other thing about the fat is fat is essential for flavor, right? Yes. And so that sort of sort of brings up this idea like what do we prioritize as health? What do we prioritize in health research, right? Yes. So mm-hmm. You're prioritizing you're not prioritizing pleasure, which there's a lot of research out there that shows that pleasure is, is an essential part of wellness, right? Absolutely. Yes. So, like we are built as humans for pleasure. And yet we live in this world. I mean, obviously it has its puritanical roots, but like we live in this world that that does not promote this idea of pleasure. And I think that, I mean, at, at the root of so many of our neuroses is this fear of pleasure. I totally agree with you. I had someone say to me, actually, um, I'm allowed to eat something, but it no. tastes good. But it tastes good. No. Why? Why can I eat that? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to get fat. It's because it tastes good, yeah. and, and it was really something we had to challenge and look at the assumptions that that this person made around carbohydrates, around the enjoying food and the satisfaction factor. That that's really what we talk about in intuitive eating: being able to enjoy food. Food is nourishment. Food is pleasure. Absolutely. 
Well, and the other thing too is like people are always so concerned about the nutrition part of intuitive eating, right? Like that's usually when people start intuitive eating, they're like, but how do I know if I'm eating well, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. When we talk about that, no one considers the fact that enjoying your food, finding pleasure in food is part of the nutrition element of eating. 100%. 100%. And it is satisfaction is, in my opinion, is key to become an intuitive eater. I don't think that you can have gentle nutrition without knowing which foods feel satisfying. And dietary fat makes food taste good and makes food stay in your body longer. And in terms of science, it keeps your blood sugar more stable for longer periods of time. And so it actually is a very important component of gentle nutrition. Yep. So thank you for mentioning that. I hope you're enjoying your gentle nutrition over there. <laughs> delicious. Totally delicious. And sometimes we'll want French fries and sometimes we'll want a garden salad or a lentil soup. That's what intuitive eating is. You can decide what you feel like having when the food opportunity arises, when it's time to eat and you recognize you're hungry or just because something looks good and tastes good and you want to have it. Well, and I think there's also this like, because we demonize food so much, we forget that like, we're not really going to want French fries every day. Like, it's just not satisfying at a certain point, right? Like, that's a very, very good point to make. That maybe it does. Or, or even with like, eat, you know, when you, when you're really hungry and you eat something, it's delicious because your, your, um, taste buds are primed. Like you're so ready for that food. And then midway through a meal, it's going to taste different because you're not as hungry. That doesn't mean you should stop, but noticing that like, the way we respond to food is completely dependent on the context. It's dependent on what we've eaten earlier in the day, earlier in the week, earlier in the month, right? Like what yeah. our stress levels are, what our circumstances Absolutely. are. Absolutely. I'm in finals for school right now. And so all I've eaten for two weeks is takeout <laughs> because I cannot even conceptualize cooking. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what takeout is made for. Yeah. And like, it's not, there, like, I remember on my way home today from therapy, I was like, I really would like to cook. And then I got really hungry and I was like, I really want chicken wings now. And so I've had my chicken wings and they were delicious. And there's still a part of me that really wants some greens. Mm -hmm. And so at my next meal, I'm going to think about that and, and like try to remember that if I get another craving, because this has happened like a bunch, like I'll want to cook, I'll want some greens. I'll be like craving like, like water filled foods because I feel a little dehydrated. Um, and then I'll reach for takeout because it's easier and it's highly palatable and it sounds good in the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's all fine. But I also know that I'll probably function a little bit better and have a, a like my brain will be a little faster. I won't feel as tired and it is final. So I need to kind of be on my, mm -hmm. my brain needs to be working. So, you know, I need to make sure I get some nutrients in there. So I'm going to try my best to remind myself of that. If I don't and I end up, you know, ordering a cheeseburger, then that's what happens. But, you know, it's that's, just... Like, that's real. Can I just say that is real life? Exactly. That's normal, gentle nutrition. That's my point. <laughs> and the fact that you recognize that after a period of time of eating perhaps takeout food and not having greens... It's amazing how your body really just talks to you. It's just amazing. Right. When you take out that external narrative. Mm -hmm. Someone said to me, if I eat a bagel, it's just an example. It's all I'm going to eat. If you say I can eat anything I want, I'm just going to eat pizza every meal, every day. And I said, okay. And how long do you think that will last? And there was no answer because the fact is after you eat a bagel for every day, every meal, you're going to find it doesn't taste so good after a while, or it may, may be delicious. You may find that you need to put some butter on it. You may find that, you know, you really want to have a salad instead. That's the part of exploration and intuitive eating that's actually the most exciting. Scary, but exciting. And there's also this idea that, like, our bodies are really smart, and, like, they know that they need nutrients to be optimally working, right? So if you're eating bagels every day, which is fine. Bagels are delicious. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, there comes a point where your body's like, okay, bagels are cool. Carbs are great. I needed those. And the, you know, the cream cheese is great. I needed that, but maybe I need a different texture or maybe I'm really needing some vitamin. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's where, you know, like our cravings really do mean something. Right. And I think that when we live in this restrictive world, all we crave is um, food that gives us comfort because we deny ourselves that comfort. But when we take out that narrative, we just crave what our bodies need. And sometimes that's comfort. Sometimes that's fat. Sometimes that's nostalgia. I have so much nostalgia induced eating, um, you know, and sometimes it's broccoli. And you know? sometimes it's cr yeah, crunchy. Sometimes it's just really crunchy. So you're right. There's a lot of there's so many factors around food dietary needs, emotional needs, physical needs at the time. I, I love how you just said it. Nostalgia. I love that. That comfort food. Yeah. It's sad sometimes because sometimes things don't taste as good as you remember them to, you know? <laughs> I do know. <laughs> All right. So we're coming up to the half hour mark. I think um, we talked about supporting um one another in if you're struggling with an eating disorder to reach out to others who are who are feel safe we talked about being able to walk into a any any scene where there is bonding around diet talk and be be, be prepared how you want to handle it whether you want to walk away from the conversation whether you want to um ignore it's really up to you but come armed to know that it's going to happen um, we talked a lot about gentle nutrition, satisfaction. I think we talked about all the, <laughs> we might have covered all the principles. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we covered a lot of principles. We didn't really talk about hunger and fullness, maybe next time. Mm -hmm. So have a lovely weekend, everybody. You too, Ashley. Good Thank luck you. with your finals. Bye, guys. Good night, everyone.